Hi, welcome to Invisible Church, the video Bible study and podcast of St. Paul's Lutheran Church, New Orleans, Minnesota. I'm Pastor Tim Smith. We're studying 1 Corinthians chapter 14. This is 1 Corinthians 14, beginning now at verse 15. So what is to be done? I will pray using my spirit, and I will pray also using my understanding. I will sing using my spirit, and I will sing also using my understanding. So here, uh, the, 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 the important part in these is the understanding. It's the second half of the two, of the two clauses. That when I pray, when I sing, when I do anything, I want to understand what I'm doing. And not just be out there fishing with my sounds. Okay? I could be out in the garden singing a, a tune with no words, right? Just as I could be out in the garden speaking in babble in tongues of some kind with no meaning. But somebody else will be more benefited if there are words to go along with it. So they're not wondering what it is that's going on. Okay, 16. Otherwise, how will an uninformed person say the amen after you give thanks, since he does not know what you are saying? To be sure, you are giving thankful enough, but the other person is not being built up. I, I should have looked this up this afternoon. I, I didn't get to it, I'm sorry. This is one of the earliest instances I have ever found of the word amen, that's where, where it's said that it's put at the end of a prayer or, a, a, or something. So, and Paul doesn't even do it here. He just says, how can you do that unless you understand what's, what's going on? So how can you say amen? Remember what amen means? You remember your Luther very well. Yea, yea, so shall it be. Amen in Hebrew, um, Truth, thus, so, um, yes, I agree with that, that kind of thing, all of those. Probably not the end, which is what I've heard some little kids think. I never as a child thought that amen meant the end. I thought it meant something more profound. You know, like, the, my prayer is done. Well, that kind of means the end, doesn't it? Okay, well. You know, that sort of Amen. Amen. Oh, to, to, to shut the preacher up? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll listen for that. If she, how old is she now, though? Oh, she's in college. Oh, she, well, if she ever comes to visit and she says it, then I'll, yeah, I won't take offense. Um, um, let's go right to my generic slide. I, uh, I, uh, you may see his photograph again in the future. I have. Um, about seven or eight different images from the 1850s of this gentleman. And to me, I think he looks like the Apostle Paul. So he's just going to be Paul for me from now on. You know, I don't know if Paul wore that kind of a tie, but, uh, but for me, the hair, the beard, the, uh, you know, I just think that that looks like Paul to me. If that guy had a robe on, would you think, yeah, okay, that's Paul. Yeah, I would, I, you know, maybe. His, his hair is just scruffy enough that I would say, no, not Jesus. You know, so Paul, you know, although he's, th that guy's reasonably good looking and you get the, uh, the impression from Paul's writings that maybe he wasn't. So maybe that's not the best picture, but I'm going to use it anyway. So, I mean, he doesn't look like he's been beat up enough to be Paul, actually. Um, so I thank God that I speak in tongues more than all of you. Isn't it a fascinating sentence? Paul, Paul says, I, I speak in tongues more. Of course, and Paul did. Paul did it occasionally in the Pentecost definition of speaking in tongues, where they uh, uh, spoke in tongues so that other people would understand him when he went into the synagogue in this or that place, and they didn't know Greek or Hebrew, and Paul would have to speak in tongues. Um, and he, he evidently did it a lot. But he says, but in the church, and let's look at that phrase, those three words, in the church. That's the context of this second sentence. What does that mean, in the church? When we're worshiping together, yes. In the sphere of the church, 
when we're gathered to worship, not when I'm out and doing my missionary work, but when we're gathered together to worship in the church, I would rather speak five words with my understanding in order to instruct others than 10,000 words in a tongue. And the Lievia del Cufato Trombetta. Not so? You don't speak Italian, so you don't know. Yeah, um, that's from Dante's Inferno. But, uh, but wouldn't it be better if I had just said something like this, which I did not say, Jesus died and rose again. Five intelligible words, right? Or whatever five words. You know, in the beginning was the, doesn't work. But in the, in the beginning, God created. God created, sure, sure. And it gets us right into the end. But those are beneficial because it's the text of God's holy word. Um, and, and, and even two words would be better than a bunch of nonsense. Et factum es postquam per cosa d'Alexander Philippi Macedo, qui primus regnavit in Graecia, egressus de terra, quetim darium regum parsum et medorum. And very good after Alexander, probably son of Philip of Macedon, who was primus already, uh, king of Greece, came from the, the, the terra Kittim, the land of the Kittim, probably Philistia. Um, he defeated Darius, king of the Persians and the Medes. This is, by the way, 1 Maccabees 1.1. One, one. In, in the Apocrypha, it's the beginning of the Latin version of first, but. When I read it in Latin, it could have been anything, right? It could have been a recipe for making uh, 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 frosting for my son's birthday cake, um, uh, rather than just this historical prologue to a pretty good book, by the way, First Maccabees. Very interesting, probably relatively authentic historical comment on what happened in between Malachi and Matthew. So of all the apocryphal books, probably the best, First Maccabees, I think. Um, Paul goes on, brothers, do not be children in your thinking, but be like babies in regard to evil and be mature in your thinking. I should have let that be its own slide. Let's take that verse apart, shall we? Can we take the middle thing about babies out for a moment in your mind and just take the outside clauses? Do not be like children in your thinking. Be mature in your thinking. Does that make better sense? Don't be, don't be childish as you think. Be mature in your thinking. And what is mature for Paul? Building up the church. You build up the church. And then in the middle, though, but be like babies in regard to evil. And what do you think he means by that? Yeah, babies um, are, are babies, baptized or not, are babies sinful? Yes, we have the sinful human nature. But do babies commit, you know, major felonies? No, no. They haven't learned to commit major felonies and crimes yet. They are sinful, but you should be like babies, not knowing really even how to sin and, you, and, and not thinking about sin. You, your mind shouldn't go there when you think about sin. Um, there's a terrible lawyer joke uh, going around right now that a lawyer was meeting with a client and the client left the retainer uh, cash on the table, a hundred dollar bill. And when the client left, the lawyer realized that it was two hundred dollar bills stuck together. So he had this moral dilemma. Do I tell my partner? You know, uh, thanks. I didn't deserve even that laugh, but but. Uh, but your, your mind shouldn't even consider ways of sinning, but should rather consider what, what should I do with this? Um, when I was a boy, uh, um, uh, let's talk about the lawyer in my hometown. Uh, I, was, um, I was running the till at my father and grandfather's paint store. I was probably 10 years old. And the lawyer from up the street was walking back and forth in front of the door of the paint store. I could see him through the windows where we had the displays and everything with his head down. 
pacing back and forth, and he'd stoop down and he was picking stuff up off the sidewalk for maybe 20 minutes. Back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And I, I could see through the, the window glass, there's the, there's the town grocery store across the street. We were, we were on Main Street. Hardware store here, and there's an insurance guy, and then the and then the lawyer, and then the bank was right there, and then the bar down the and and, and that's Main Street Point at and, and Grandma went out and asked him what he was doing, and he said, "Look at all this, and there's 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 change all over the ground." And it was it was it was kind of a, a windy day, and there were there were leaves too, so he was, you know, finding all these coins that were scattered on the ground, and. I was 10 years old and my thought was free money, you know, but both the lawyer and my dear grandma Rose, their thought was somebody lost this. And there's probably four or $5 here in, you know, and what year would that be? I was 10, 1974, you know, and four or $5 in 74 was not all of your groceries, but maybe half of your grocery money. Uh, for for a shopping trip for the day, and those and so they put it in a bag, and they decided that they would take it over to the bank, and that if anybody and they would told the other storekeepers in town if anybody lost all this money, it's in a paper bag over at the bank. We found it, and as I and I think somebody did actually come and ask for it and found it, but sinful ten year old me, I didn't think that way at all, but my sainted grandmother rose she her her mind didn't even go there it was this belongs to somebody this is important they should get this back so be like babies in regard to evil and then paul says it is written in the law and i want to point out where in the law is this written by different tongues and by foreign lips i will speak to this people and even so they will not listen to me says the lord that's actually isaiah uh, so what does Paul mean by the law? I think he means law here in the Psalm 119 sense of elsewhere in Scripture. This is just in the Old Testament somewhere. Uh, Isaiah is not even the Torah. It's not Moses. It's just Old Testament. But in the law, uh, by different tongues. And this is that passage in Isaiah where of uh, uh uh, the, the people are making fun of Isaiah by saying nonsense, kav la kav, sav la sav, rule on rule. It's that, uh, however the translation goes, I should know it, I did it, but I, I but, but do and do, yeah, yeah, rule on rule. And then, and then right after that, that that's I think verse 10, and then this is verse 11. Um, by different tongues and by foreign lips, I will speak to this people, and even so, they will not listen to me, says the Lord. So whether they... Whether, if, if they've shut their hearts off to me, God says, whether I speak to them in their own language or in tongues, they're not going to believe me. Which reminds me of what um, is said to the rich man in the story of the rich man and poor Lazarus, where he says um, he's in hell and he says, go and send someone to my brothers. And it's Abraham who says, even if, uh, they have Moses and the prophets. Even if somebody were to rise from the dead, they wouldn't believe him. Yeah. So therefore, Paul gets a therefore here. Therefore, tongues are a sign meant for unbelievers, not believers. Whereas prophecy is for believers, not unbelievers. Does this sound familiar? This was our agree-disagree question at the beginning of class. Tongues are a sign meant for unbelievers, not believers. Um, yeah, that's what Paul is saying, that tongues, um, tongues are a way, an entry point for unbelievers. Oh, I hear my language being spoken. I want to go see what's going on. Um, that, and, and, or um, somebody comes in into the assembly, they hear somebody speaking in tongues, and it's a wow, like a miracle, like a healing or, or, or something like that. Like someone's been cured of deafness or blindness or, 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 or whatever it is. And then the message comes and they realize, oh, the message has weight because I've seen the miracle. And so tongues are a sign meant for unbelief. Believers don't need tongues. You have the word of God. You have faith. 
Something else, Jeff. So, so does this, does this con, this whole tackle, the way this is written, does this cause us to lean more towards tongues being known human languages? Certainly they are in, at, at Pentecost, known human languages. And certainly in the book of Acts, because we have it happening later in the book of Acts as well. Paul gets to, no, it's not, it's Peter. Did I say Paul before? It's Peter gets to the, is it the other Antioch, the one on the coast? And, or is it, you know, is it Joppa or something like that? And there are tongues there too. Um, and um, uh, those are known languages, but unlearned. In chapter 14, we still kind of have a question mark, and I, I can't pin us down more than that. To our, is Paul, When Paul talks about speaking in tongues here, is it unlearned human languages? Could I suddenly speak Hawaiian? Or is it some, can I say angelic, unknown sounds that mean something to an interpreter, but not to me? I, so... I would be more comfortable saying that they are unlearned languages, but I, I mean, I'll let it sit there. I'm going to let that float there. Yeah. So, oh, that, but I, can I talk about the picture before we can read the first? This is the church at Shiloh. I took this picture last week. Um, so you see how, how deep it is. I'm right in the very front of the church with a lectern and uh, it's a 19th century edition of a King James Bible in really good condition, but almost unreadable because of the typeface. It was almost like German script, very difficult to read. Um, and the floorboards, it's up about three feet in the air, and those are one by fours, or some of them are one by fives, and some of them are one by twos. They're just floor, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's handmade. And uh, I'm probably, can I, would anybody get mad if I said that I'm, Close to 300 pounds. Okay, nobody would say, no, come on, Pastor, add a zero there, whatever. But I'm, uh, no, but, uh, but uh, I was making those floorboards kind of dip and creak, and I was nervous about walking in there. And, um, uh, but I took this picture looking back at the congregation, because can you count them? How many pews are there? If you can call them pews. Though there are eight rough cut logs there with just just tree branches sticking in for, for seats, um, eight of them. So you're talking about 32, you could get 60 people in there. And that's a little tiny space, but you could get a congregation of 60 people in there, of course, without you know COVID restrictions, um, 18, 1850, 60, but um, a neat little church and just enough light to be able to read the Bible without a lamp or a candle or anything like that. But that I, I get the impression that the outside of the church is probably original. And I certainly seem to me like the floorboards are original, but maybe they're not. Um, but I think the pews maybe are reproductions, but the lectern also looks pretty original to me too. Because it, it, it had, at one point it had some kind of paper or wallpaper glued to the lecture, now it's kind of peeling away and rolling up. Um, but, and there is just outside of this church, a modern Methodist church, Shiloh Church. It's still owned by the congregation. So, and they've decided to maintain the old building. So, but there is, there is a Methodist. And I, I believe the Shiloh, the original Shiloh Church wasn't Methodist. It was uh, uh, the Dunkards or something like that, but that the modern one is Methodist, but. Okay, well, I need to our verse anyway. So if the whole church comes together in the same place and all speak in tongues and uninformed visitors or unbelievers come in, won't they say that you are crazy? So if everybody's doing blah, 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 they're speaking in tongues and a visitor comes in, they'll, what's going on in here? But Paul says, if I'll prophesy, and some unbeliever or uninformed visitor comes in, he is reproved by all and judged by all. The secrets of his heart are revealed, and under those circumstances, 
he will fall down in his face and worship God, declaring God really is among you. Why would he be convicted like this if everybody is speaking his language? Because what are they saying that's going to, they're all speaking the same thing in faith. We all believe the same thing. We believe in God, the Father Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth. And uh, we believe that these are his Ten Commandments, and this is how we sin. And he is going to fall in his face and say, I've sinned too. You are worshiping the Almighty God, and I'm scared. I'm terrified. So that, instead of coming in and saying you're all crazy, he comes in and says, this cuts me to the heart. So that's building up not only the congregation, but even an outsider. And that's what Paul's getting at here. You've been listening to Invisible Church, the Bible study podcast from St. Paul's Lutheran Church, New Orleans, Minnesota.